Hello and welcome to Revolutionary Ideas, the Marxist podcast from Socialist Alternative. You might have noticed we haven't been around for a while since our previous episode on the Spanish Revolution, but now we're back and we're aiming to bring these episodes out regularly again with a regular dose of history, theory and socialist ideas for all of our listeners. To bring us back into action, we're starting off with a very special episode for you. This is a recording of a discussion we held with Paul Morehouse. Paul is a member of Socialist Alternative in Scotland and is also a member of Socialist Alternative's National Committee. We discussed the period of 1935 to 1948. This was a period that included the deepest and widest war in human history, the Second World War, but it was also a period of revolution and upheavals. In May 1917, Vladimir Lenin, the Russian revolutionary, quoted the military general Karl von Clausewitz. He said, war is a continuation of politics by other means. Taking this in mind, we ask a number of questions. We ask, what was the character of this war? Was it a war for democracy? Was it an inter-imperialist war? Uh, and what did genuine Marxists at the time say about it? What were the results of the war? Now, I have to say the quality of the recording in this episode is uh, a little bit uh, hit and miss, but we hope that it's still a useful beginning to this podcast yet again. I'll now get out of your way. I uh, hope you enjoy the episode. So I guess first off, Paul, just to start with the question, what was it that really led to World War Two? You know, what were the uh, what were the forces involved? But also, was it this kind of special war of democracy against fascism? Or was it a bit more complex than that? Well, I think really, um, in a sense, World War Two was the second round of the imperialist conflict that we saw between 1914 and 1918. That in a sense, uh, it was a, a result of the failure of the Versailles Treaty uh, at the end of the First World War to resolve the imperialist conflicts between Britain, America and France on the one hand and Germany on the on the other hand which had led to the First World War and that uh, that uh, though in no way had those been resolved at best they'd been put on ice and left it to one side and that these were reawakened by the changes that took place between the First World War and the Second World War by the crippling economic crisis of world capitalism in the 1930s. And then they were particularly, it was ex accelerated by the, the Nazism, which smashed the German working class and set in train the rearming and expansion of German imperialism, which was seen by the uh, West as being a, a, a threat to their domination of, uh, of world uh, uh, markets. But I think there's another factor that we have to take into account, that just as in the uh, First World War, all the uh, uh, imperialist powers, however much they may have been at uh, uh, odds, were, uh, had, had, had uh, two things in common. First of all, that they were determined to try and smash the workers' state in Russia, that had arisen as a result of the First World War. And on the other hand, they were all terrified and they all uh, uh, lived in fear of the power uh, of, their, of their own uh, uh, working class. So how did that play out? Well, I think that really, uh, if we look at the, uh, uh, the way in which the, the, the power of the working class influenced the progress of the, of, of the Second World War, we can see... It uh, uh, having an impact both on the way that the war started in France and in the way that it ended in uh, uh, France. Because Germany invaded uh, uh, France and took control of France, not by a military victory over the French uh, generals, but because the French generals actually were more scared of the possibility of, uh, of, of a workers' uh, revolution in France and the power of the French working class than they were of their so-called uh, uh, enemy in uh, Germany. In, in 1940, Pétain and the French generals surrendered to the Nazis rather than take the only step which could have guaranteed uh, uh, victory against the against uh, 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 German invasion, which was arming the working uh, class. They look back at the history of France. They look back at two events, I think, really. They look back 
at the mass movement that had shaken France in 1936 under the uh, Popular Front uh, 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 government, where there were mass strikes, workers occupying factories and pushing that uh, uh, government far to the left in terms of the uh, the uh, uh, reforms that it carried uh, uh, through. But even more, they looked at the last time that uh, that uh, or the last but one time that the uh, that uh, French and German imperialism had come face to face, which was in 19, uh, 1871 during the uh, Franco-Prussian War, when again the uh, the, uh, the, the the bourgeois leaders of uh, of France, the French ruling class, had surrendered to the, the, the Germans because. Uh, the alternative would have been an uprising of the, of, of the works. In fact, our uprising took place in the form of the Paris uh, uh, Commune when the workers took control of, uh, of that uh, uh, city and the French ruling class sued for peace with the uh, uh, Prussian imperialism in order to crush that uh, uh, uprising. And actually, at the time of Pétain's uh, uh, surrender, the division of France into uh, one zone occupied directly by the Germans and the, uh, the other half under the control of the uh, puppet Vichy uh, government. Uh, our forerunners, the, uh, uh, the Workers' International League, and Ted Grant, who was uh, one of the founders of, of the tendency uh, that is now International Socialist Alternative, wrote in our paper that uh, France was betrayed the real fifth column was the capitulation government of financiers, manufacturers, millionaires and generals. They sold the French people into the hands of, uh, of Hitler. Rather than lose all their profits to their fr the French masses, it was the thing that they really uh, uh, feared, these patriots, uh, uh, so-called, preferred a few scraps from the tables of the Nazis. And then if we look again at how things played out at the end of the uh, war in, and at the end of the, uh, 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 the German occupation of, uh, of France, if you look at the uh, capitalist history books, they'll tell you that, uh, uh, that de Gaulle and the Free French Army marched into Paris in 1944, having driven the Nazis out. But in actual fact, the German army of occupation was driven out not by the Allied armies, but by a general strike, an armed insurrection by the French working uh, uh, class. And in fact, they couldn't even retreat from Paris because there was a railway strike. The, 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 the Allies and the German high command had to negotiate with the shop stewards and the workers represented on the railways to be allowed to evacuate the defeated uh, uh, army. And de Gaulle, the, uh, the future president of, uh, of, of France, leader of the Free French Army, had to be airlifted into Paris from uh, 30, 40, 50 miles away by uh, the Americans. Um, and and, and this, uh, this role played by the working class at the end of the war wasn't unique to France at all. In fact, uh, 1946 saw the biggest strike wave in the history of the United States. Uh, it was the high point of membership of the Communist Party, which is widely seen as the revolutionary party of the working class. But also there was a massive movement about in, 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 in Italy and in many other countries across uh, uh, Europe. It was the working class that was flexing its muscles that uh, made the defeat of Nazism uh, possible. Well, as, as you say, I think it's really important to place the war in its proper context and see not just, um, you know, the, the events leading up to World War Two, you know, the working class, you know, placing its stamp on events, essentially, and, you know, the ruling class, the capitalist class in France out of fear of the working class capitulating um, to the Nazis and to, and to fascism, but also even by the end, as, as, as you just said then, you know, the working class beginning to kind of flex its muscles um, in the aftermath of the war. Um, but what actually was the role then of the communist parties? What was the role of Stalinism um, in these quite, you know, revolutionary events? Because there's actually an idea that, you know, will sometimes be circulated in saying that, 
Stalin, you know, for all of his brutality, actually helped to defeat Hitler. But I think we would we would question that idea, wouldn't we? And we would we would criticize that idea. Yeah, well, I think actually, again, what we saw in the 1940s, uh, 1944 to 46, was very much uh, similar to what played out uh, in France uh, a decade before, at the time of the Popular Front uh, government. Whilst there was massive movements of the working class, the uh, uh, the, the, the Communist Party actually um, uh, uh, played a role in uh, holding back that movement and allowing the capitalist class to uh, to uh, uh, to regroup and re-establish their role. And I think that actually that is because uh, Stalinism had become a barrier to working class revolution rather than a party ad- ad- advancing it. And I think we're, to explain that, we have to look at what the communist parties had become and what they were defending. And all of the communist parties throughout the world were really, uh, 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 had become uh, representatives of the interests of the bureaucratic caste that was uh, sitting atop the workers, uh, the workers' state in Russia. In 19, uh, after the 1917 revolution, Lenin and Trotsky had argued that if socialism was to uh, uh, triumph, if workers' democracy was to thrive in Russia, then you had to have a, a spreading of the revolution to the rest of the world. But uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the isolation of the revolution led a bureaucratic caste to come and sit on top of the, of the planned uh, uh, economy and the idea had developed that it was possible to build socialism in one country now we would say that that's a mistaken idea but it's a doubly if not a trebly uh, uh, mistaken idea in the context of a relatively backward country like uh, Russia and increasingly the policies of the communist movement internationally we became uh, 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 identified with the survival of uh, 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 the Soviet Union in isolation and the interest of the caste on top of uh, of Soviet society. And they saw themselves bound up, not with the interest of the world revolution, but being uh, based on the outcome of diplomatic deals and alliances with uh, bourgeois governments on the part of... Of, uh, of of Stalin. That included even a pact with the Nazis as well, didn't yeah. it? They went so far as to do that. Yeah, in yeah. fact, what happened was they flip-flopped between uh, the different imperialist uh, uh, blocs uh, for a whole period in the 1930s. They attempted to find some kind of accommodation with France, Britain and, 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 and America, and that led to the betrayal, not just of, uh, of, 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 of the French working class, but even more... Uh, horrendously, the defeat of the the Spanish Revolution, and then they turned 180 degrees, and uh, uh, on, a, on the beginning of the uh, Second World War, there was a pact of non-aggression between Hitler and Stalin, and then the, the, the German uh, uh, army invaded Russia, and they were forced to turn 180 degrees again, and uh, and uh, enter into an alliance with Britain and France. And after the uh, uh, the Japanese uh, attack on Pearl Harbor, the uh, the U- United States and again the British Trotskyists explained that at the at, at, at the time Hitler leaves uh, 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 Stalin with no alternative. The bureaucracy are forced to defend the Soviet Union, but they do this in a distorted and bureaucratic manner. They intend to continue to devour four-fifths of the goods produced for consumption in the Soviet Union. That is what they're fighting for, not for the uh, uh, the planned economy. Stalin desires the defeat of Hitler, but he does not wish for a proletarian revolution in Germany because the seizure of power by the German proletariat would also sweep Stalinism aside. So we can see that if you look at the whole history of Stalin... And the uh, and the Russian bureaucracy, and 
following uh, uh, lamely in 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 their wake the communist party's inter international the only factor that was consistent between uh, uh, the rise of hitler in 1932 and his defeat in 1945 was one of betrayal of the working uh, uh, class in fact under the uh, uh, pact with the uh, the nazis stalin had actually handed German and Austrian socialist refugees who'd fled to the Soviet Union to escape the Nazis back to uh, uh, to Hitler, many of whom perished in the uh, 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 concentration camps. And in another t in another two years, in June 1943, the, uh, he actually dissolved the Communist International, the Party of World Revolution that had been established by uh, 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 by Lenin. And Trotsky, and look at the record of uh, of, of 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 Stalin and bureaucracy. They were simply uh, making official what they'd already done. They'd stifled the Comintern uh, uh, to death. They'd imprisoned it within uh, 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 two false theories: the theory of socialism in one country, and world worldwide. They'd pushed the the the, the idea of a of a workers' revolution into the background. Instead, they were arguing. Uh, again and again for a, a theory of what they called stages that first you carry out a democratic revolution and then at some time in the far distant future we can start talking about uh, the transformation of, uh, of socialism whereas the one lesson of 1917 was that in this epoch of imperialism epoch of 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 in actual fact when uh, uh, capitalism is overripe to be overthrown there is no way that we can achieve uh, democracy there's no way that we can uh, uh, defend even the most basic democratic rights to the right of nations to self-determination except through the socialist revolution and this led to betrayal after betrayal in 19, February 1945, Stalin, Roosevelt and Churchill sat down and, lit and cold bloodedly divided Europe into spheres of, 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 of what they called spheres of, uh, of, of, of interest. Lines on the map, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 The capitalist powers accepted the reality that Eastern Europe was, was already occupied or was becoming occupied by the Red Army. In return, Stalin handed imperialism not just those that areas that they had liberated themselves, but also places like Greece, where Italian and German fascism had been defeated not by uh, 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 Churchill and, 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 and the, the capitalist allies, but by communist uh, partisans and allowed them to restore capitalism and uh, 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 the monarchy. And this led in time to the, the uh, sick fiasco when in April 1944, 28 uh, 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 communist militants were mown down by the royalist police in, in Athens on the direct orders of the British uh, uh, government. And they actually went to their deaths chanting, Viva Churchill, Viva Roosevelt, Viva Stalin. This idea that there was some common interest between the worker state of Russia on the one, in, 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 in Russia and the Soviet Union on the one hand, and the, uh, uh, the, the imperialist butchers in the West. But it's also true that, you know, the, what you describe, obviously, you know, as, as the worker state uh, that existed in the Soviet Union, you know, the planned economy still remained kind of the greatest threat of imperialism, isn't it? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, because actually, um, just like Hitler, the imperialist leaders in the West were looking for an opportunity to destroy the, op the, the October Revolution and its achievements. That was the only basis on which they could enter into an alliance with Stalin, uh, and, and in fact, um, all along they were looking for opportunities to weaken the workers' state. So, for instance, in 1942, when uh, uh, when uh, 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 the Russian troops were uh, were, were surrounded in uh, uh, Stalingrad and fighting a last ditch uh, battle to halt the German invasion, Stalin appealed to the West to send troops to uh, to the eastern front and uh, uh, the response 
of, uh, of, uh, of, of Ru- Churchill and Roosevelt will say, well, yeah, we'll send you troops. We'll send you troops to go and uh, defend, in inverted commas, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the oil fields of, De- of Baku and Tbilisi. Now, what does that mean? That doesn't mean that they're helping the, uh, uh, the Russians. What it means is they're trying to make a grab for the oil, the oil resources of the Soviet Middle, Middle East in addition to the to to the ones that they've already seized in uh, in in Iran and Iraq what uh, US and Britain were hoping for throughout the uh, second world war was that Russia and Germany would devour each other militarily and economically and that they could walk in and take over the uh, uh, the ruins but what actually happened was that uh, 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 the victory of the Russian uh, uh, troops, of Russian workers and youth who fought against the Nazis at Stalingrad, led to a, a, a reversal, led to uh, a sweep westward by the, uh, uh, the, the the Red Army, which in turn set in train processes which led to one in three of the world's population living under uh, the planned economy for most of the next half century. But even if you look at how, for example, the Putin regime in Russia paints World War II to be, they talk about it as this kind of great uh, patriotic war, don't they, that Stalin himself um, won rather than those millions of of Russian soldiers. Um, So it it wasn't Stalin's victory, was it? We have to look at it on on a deeper level than that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, In fact, Russia... And the Russian troops who bore nine tenths of the of uh, Russian troops and Russian civilians who bore nine tenths of the brunt of the defeat of of Nazism won that war not because of Stalin but despite him. You know, if you look at Stalin's relationship to the uh, uh, to the gains of October, it's it's one riddled with failures. They, they actually start with his prevarications and confusions on the eve of October when he actually opposed the uh, uh, the workers taking power. On the eve of the Second World War, uh, Stalin purged the, the leadership of, of the Red Army, uh, uh, causing enormous confusion and disruption within the, the ranks of the army, which undoubtedly led to some of Hitler's initial uh, military successes. And why did he do that? He did that because, as far as he was concerned, the, uh, uh, the, the general staff of the Red Army was tainted by the fact that many of them had served alongside and under the command of Leon Trotsky as the, as the first commander-in-chief of that uh, army. But above all, the fight to defend uh, the Soviet Union was crippled by the burden of inefficiency and corruption that, ca- that came as a result of, of, of the rule of the bureaucratic caste that he sat at the head of. Um, and it was the Russian working class that was really left to endure the pain of that as well, the result of that, wasn't it? Absolutely. You know, if you look at the, uh, uh, the history of that war, it was the Russian workers who, uh, who, who endured starvation during the uh, uh, sieges of Leningrad and Stalingrad. They saw that they uh, uh, experienced destruction of countless other towns, cities and villages right across the western half of the Soviet Union. And it was, above all, the slaughter of, of, of a generation of Russian youth uh, who died fighting to de- defend their state, and they fought to defend it so uh, uh, so much, precisely because they were defending the economic gains and the social gains that working people in the Soviet Union had won since 1917. And this was essentially a class movement rather than a patriotic uh, uh, movement. There's no doubt that uh, uh, it, because uh, Stalin feared a revolutionary movement of the working class. He sought to derail this into a, a, a nationalist uh, uh, rhetoric. There was, uh, there was, there was uh, uh, in the pages of Pravda, the paper of the Communist Party in Russia, ha- had a grossly chauvinist uh, uh, nationalism, anti-German uh, racism, which is what makes it so easy for Putin and the oligarchs now to uh, adopt the mantle of 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 of, mm. of Stalin in contradiction to their 
deep de- uh, de- detestation of, of, of Lenin and a genuine tradition of the Bolsheviks. Well, when Putin even launched his, you know, his, his uh, invasion of Ukraine, um, he took to the TV and, you know, quite famously said that the very, you know, the existence of the Ukrainian nation um, is, is, well, it, it doesn't exist and criticised the, the, the Bolsheviks for doing that, criticised Lenin and the Bolsheviks for acknowledging that, that there even existed a Ukrainian nation, but then went on to say, oh, but thank God Stalin reversed that and made it Russian again. So actually, you know, you can see in a really twisted, deformed way, you know, Putin kind of, you know, confirming exactly what we're saying, but obviously from a, from a very reactionary and a very backward point of view. But... One thing I wanted to ask you about was um, there's a, a quote from Lenin um, where he said quite famously that war is the midwife of uh, revolutions. Um, I'd, I'd like you to explain a little bit about why he said that. But one of the ways in which Stalinism justified betraying those, you know, the, those re- potentially revolutionary movements in Eastern Europe was by saying that revolutions weren't on the cards. The only choices were. Uh, what they called democracy, they meant capitalist democracy, or fascism on the other. So what were the prospects for a socialist revolution during World War II? And if there were prospects for it, how could Marxists have turned the war into a revolution? Right. Well, I think I think that uh, that, that that we see very small examples of how that uh, could have been done in the work of the very small and isolated groups of Trotskyists. Because whilst uh, the rhetoric of the Russian regime was about the barbarism of the Germans, about driving back effectively the Hon, uh, and there was no attempt to make a class appeal to the rank and file of the German army, which had been the approach of the of the Red Army uh, when confronted with invasion uh, after the after the Russian revolution in in occupied uh, europe particularly in france and belgium the uh, uh, trotskyists there actually attempted to make a class appeal to the uh, to, to to the rank and file of the german uh, army so for instance the, uh, the, the the french trotskyists produced a paper called arbeiter and soldat workers and soldiers which actually spoke about the common interests of german uh, uh, soldiers and french workers in fighting the uh, capitalist uh, uh, class and there's no doubt that the uh, the german high command uh, were terrified by that approach. So they hunted down the Trotskyists. Many of them died in uh, concentration camps as a result of their attempt to make a class uh, 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 approach. And in doing this, they were really reapplying the methods of the Bolsheviks in 1917 to 21, when they had defended the worker state on the basis of the political independence uh, and uh, the international unity of the working class. Could, could you say a little bit more about that, actually? Because one of the ideas that sometimes, you know, gets fed was that the Bolsheviks simply called for the defeat um, of their own uh, ruling class. But it was a little bit more complicated than that, wasn't it? And had to be more complex than that in World War Two. Absolutely. Um, I think, that first of all, what you have to recognise is that revolutionary defeatism was always a, a, a slogan which Lenin developed to put forward amongst the advanced layers of the of the working class and it reflected the fact that especially in the early periods of 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 wars and we see this today actually in Russia in relationship to the Ukrainian uh, uh invasion uh socialists will find themselves isolated and having to struggle to swim against the stream of a dominant patriotic consciousness during an, an imperialist uh, uh, a war. And so Lenin raised this slogan at the beginning of the, of the First World War of revolutionary defeatism, and he addressed it to the small revolutionary uh, minority to help them orientate themselves. And exactly the same issue arose for the Trotskyists during the Second World War, because the communist parties and uh, the other workers' parties were uncritically supporting 
the uh, uh, imperialist war efforts of their own ruling class. But they were doing so in uniquely, uniquely difficult uh, circumstances because the mass of the workers saw the war as one against Nazism. Hmm. And, uh, like they an only... anti-fascist war of defence, almost, was yes, how it would have been yeah, seen by yeah, many. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they saw Nazism as being really the dis- distilled essence of racist reaction, which had been welded to uh, smash the German class brothers and sisters, and was now crushing all of continental Europe under the Iron Hill. So in that situation, simply to uh, shouting about revolutionary defeatism would have left them entirely uh, isolated from the mass of the uh, uh, class. It's one thing to understand that the ruling class were waging uh, what was essentially a war of imperialist uh, aggression. Entirely another one to demonstrate to this to workers who were working in munitions factories or to the sailors who were uh, serving in the Arctic convoy. But also, just to talk about revolutionary defeatism is to oversimplify the uh, uh, the, the, the real p- uh, position of Lenin in the First World War. In the early th- 1930s, Trotsky had explained that in Russia, before the war, the Bolsheviks had con- constituted four-fifths of the advanced working uh, uh, class. But after the February Revolution... Uh, rule had passed into the hands of the defences, to those who were lining up with the capitalist uh, 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 class. But the, the, the Bolsheviks, in a space of eight months between February and October, conquered the overwhelming majority of the workers. The divisive role in this conquest was played not by the refusal to defend the bourgeois fatherland, but by the slogan of all power to the Soviets. And in mm-hmm. fact, we'd say that, it, that uh, uh, even before you could raise the slogan of uh, all power to the uh, 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 Soviets, you also needed the transitional demands of bread, peace and land. Which was, w- used, which was raised by the Bolsheviks, wasn't it, during yeah, the revolution? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and was necessary to bring about uh, the October Revolution. So was Lenin wrong to call for revolutionary defeat for, for your own country in, in an imperialist war? Or Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think <laughs> I the point that. is that Lenin's formula, was, uh, which, is more, which is more correctly expressed as defeat is the lesser evil, was not intended to mobilise the masses to seize power, but to orient a small minority of revolutionary cadres in order to enable this. And in fact, as Trotsky explained in 1934, it means not that defeat of one's own country is the lesser evil compared with the defeat of the enemy country, but that a military defeat resulting from the growth of the revolutionary movement is infinitely more beneficial to the proletariat than military victory which is assured by civil peace. And Trotsky went on to say that really... If he wanted to to encapsulate what Lenin was talking about, it would probably be better to use the formula that Karl Riebknecht, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the revolutionary social democrat in Germany, uh, uh, had uh, had uh, uh, had put forward that in the time of war, the chief enemy of the people is at home rather than abroad. That's re- that's really you know useful to 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 draw on because I think one thing that you can really um, get from looking into the history of this is how the 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 genuine Marxists of the time that we would say um, you know were, were the were the Trotskyists uh, the followers of the the left opposition of Leon Trotsky um, and so on sort of you know they 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 were very clear um, in saying that they couldn't said you know there there couldn't be a pause to the class struggle just because of the conditions of the war you know ultimately of course you know um, you know the, taking the war to Hitler was an absolute necessity but it should be part of the struggle um, of the working class in in those uh, or, or you know should be should flow from the struggle of the working class in those countries but also obviously you know on on a more fundamental level like you said earlier the rise of the Nazis didn't just come from nowhere. It came from the the total chaos, the mess um, that was capitalism in Europe at the time. Um, so, could you say a little bit more about that? Actually, about what the Trotskyists and the you know the genuine Marxists in Europe and America were doing at the time, compared to say what the Communist Party were doing um, in Britain. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that to you to explain that a bit yeah. further. Right. 
Okay, well, I think what, one of the things that we need to start with is that they always insisted that the only people who had a genuine interest in defeating fascism were the, were the only class that had genuine interest in, in defeating fascism was the working class. So they always argued that the prosecution of the war, if workers were to serve in the war, should be under the control of workers as a class. So, for instance, they argued for uh, uh, trade unionisation within the armed forces, for uh, military training to be under the control of, uh, of, of, of the working class and not under the control of the, of, of the bosses. But they were saying that we can't trust the capitalist class to, uh, to, to fight the, the Nazis. And that is uh, 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 entirely, made entire sense to workers who remembered the time of Cable Street when the uh, Daily Express had had a headline saying, All hail to the black shirts. Mm. And suddenly the Daily Express. The, the Ex- fascists. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. All, uh, the, the Daily Express was suddenly put, putting itself forward as a patriotic paper fighting the Nazis. But the other thing that they insisted was on the right of workers to continue mm. the struggle at home. And so as a result, the leaders of the uh, the American Trotskyists were put on trial for treason because they demanded the right of workers to organise as a class. And in, 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 in a brilliant defence, they ended up being acquitted uh, because they, they put forward the ideas of Trotsky in an American uh, uh, courtroom. And uh, I would strongly recommend that comrades should, should read the book Socialism on Trial by James uh, uh, Cannon, which is a record of that uh, trial as a brilliant uh, example of how to defend socialist ideas in the most uh, uh, difficult of terrain. So, of course, you've said a lot there about, you know, the, the, the role that the American Trotskyists played. Uh, of course, that important book by uh, James P. Cannon, one of the leaders of American Trotskyism. I just want to bring it back to Britain, though, and, and, and ask, you know, in, in contrast to what the Trotskyists were doing, what was the line of the Stalinists of the Communist Party? Well, the Communist Party were, were, were the most ardent uh, 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 demanders that the Trotskyists should be uh, uh, prosecuted. The Communist Party put out a, 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 a leaflet accusing the Trotskyists of being agents of, 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 of Hitler. An absolutely scurrilous pamphlet. Was, uh, it was so bad that uh, the, the, the Revolutionary Communist Party actually put out a leaflet in, 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 in reply with offering a reward of five pounds, which was a, a, a very significant uh, sum at the time, to any member of the Communist Party who could produce, uh, who could, who could uh, a shred prove, of evidence for any of it. Basically, well, 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 <laughs> well, who, who could who could produce evidence yeah. that a, a sing that in, any single sentence in that in that uh, pamphlet uh, did not contain a lie. <laughs> yeah. And this, this reflected what was happening across the world, where the communist parties, which had been established as vanguards of the revolution, were effectively being reduced uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, the border guards of the Soviet Union. And worse than that, actually, they were, uh, they were applauding Stalin's alliance with their, their own class uh, enemy. So, for instance... In February 1945, the Executive Committee of the Communist Party of Great Britain claimed that the Yalta Agreement, the one which, if you remember, led to the uh, uh, destruction of the communist movement in, in, in Greece, would remove the political, economic and social causes of war and achieve an age-old dream of world humanity. How we just and that did... didn't happen. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to ask how that those ills could be removed whilst Churchill and Roosevelt still provide, presided over capitalism intact. The Communist Party went on to offer to enter into a post-war government of national unity to uh, uh, take seats in a in, in a government alongside Churchill. And, uh, and 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 the Tories. Now, this uh, blatant uh, class collaboration on the behalf of the Communist Party in Britain was, to a large extent, cut across by by the landslide victory for the Labour Party in the 1945 election, which made the idea of any kind of uh, collaboration with the Tories entirely impossible. But 
uh, elsewhere in Europe, there's no doubt that the policies of the Communist Party, of their attempt to try and patch some kind of deal with the, with the, with uh, with uh, sections at least of the ruling uh, class, played the role of derailing the revolutionary movements. We've already seen some elements of how that occurred in France, but it was probably even more blatant in Italy. Well, I, th- I think, you know, you, you mentioned Italy there and revolutionary movements in Italy, um, you know, in the you know the run-up to the end of, of World War II. I don't think that's particularly well-known, actually, is it? That's, that's slightly lesser known, actually, when you, you, know, you compare it to events in other countries. Could you say a little bit more about that? How, how, how did that happen? What, what happened in Italy? Well, I mean, first of all, I think it's worth bearing in mind that uh, Italian fascism was not defeated by the Allies' invasion that in actual fact Mussolini had been over t- over overthrown by a, a, an uprising of, of workers and it was actually a workers' militia that caught uh, Mussolini uh, trying to uh, flee Italy and uh, strung him up in the, in, 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 in the streets. And initially uh, that movement was put down by an invasion by the German uh, uh, fascists to uh, to take control of their of their erstwhile uh, ally, and again after the war itself, there was mass movements of of workers, a uh, strike wave after uh, a strike wave, not just in the big cities, but uh, in the rural south, there were there were movements of uh, peasants to uh, uh, an agricultural workers, you know, for instance, a strike of nine hundred thousand steel workers and uh, mass movements of, uh, of textile workers, which spread across uh, the, the country. There's no doubt that if there had been a revolutionary uh, uh, party which prepared to uh, take power, and in fact workers looked to the Communist Party of Italy to take power, but three or four years after the, uh, uh, the defeat of uh, fascism, the Communist Party continued to sit as junior partners in a coalition with the uh, uh, Christian uh, uh, Democrats. And that led, in actual fact, to a situation where, uh, uh, despite um, you know uh, mass support for the Communist Party, they were defeated in the uh, 1948 uh, election, and the Christian Democrats then ruled uh, Italy for for four for four decades. Why were they defeated? Well, there was. I think. I think there. Yeah, there was. There's no doubt. That there were that there were a number of uh, of of reasons. Firstly, there was uh, uh, there was uh, um, mass interference by the American uh, 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 powers in 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 particular. The country was uh, flooded with uh, with martial aid, which was given on a very uh, biased manner to uh, to Christian Democrat municipalities rather than uh, communist municipalities. The uh, CIA certainly interfered in the conduct of the elections, but I think the fundamental reason was that the workers were exhausted, that the movement was uh, exhausted, and that the uh, the Communist Party had continued to sit in uh, government and was tainted by their involvement with uh, with the Christian Democrats. And the Christian Democrats, you know, were not like uh, uh, some nice. Uh, cosy uh, a bunch of bourgeois uncles they were ruthless butchers they were in uh, alliance with the mafia they had uh, for instance uh, uh, in uh, palermo in uh, 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 sicily the mafia had gunned down uh, 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 communist mil- militants and their families including young children during the may day parade in 1947 and the failure of the Communist Party to mount any kind of effective resistance to these uh, uh, attacks had led to a certain disillusionment with workers. Workers are prepared to uh, struggle, but uh, the, uh, but uh, uh, if it doesn't bring about uh, uh, gains uh, and, and and victories, certain disillusionment uh, begins to set in. This, in a way, kind of reminds me of, of, of the Stalinists having betrayed an earlier revolution in Spain. Uh, I'd refer people to the previous episode. And one part of that was how they justified it with this idea of the Popular Front. Could you explain more about that? 
Yes, yes. I think I think I think there is a definite. There are definite uh, parallels between the way that the the the, the Communist Party in Spain in uh, in 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 the nineteen thirties. Uh, entered into a coalition with uh, with, uh, with with capitalist uh, parties, uh, held back the uh, the movement in the interests of that uh, uh, alliance, and led directly to the defeat of the of the revolution and what happened in in Italy in the nineteen forties. But I guess that there are some that there are some uh, uh, differences. In the first case, in the nineteen thirties. The working class suffered an outright dis- de- defeat. It was uh, it was uh, it was uh, completely uh, uh, crushed. Half a million workers were uh, slaughtered, and you had uh, a, a, a military dictatorship established, which ruled Spain for ho- uh, four decades. In Italy, in the nineteen forties, uh, uh, although the workers failed to take uh, 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 power. There still remained significant elements of democracy and civic free- freedoms, and the workers did actually experience, in the long term, improvements in their living standards and uh, welfare. And uh, in actual fact, the, uh, uh, the uh, and our uh, tendency uh, characterised this process as something which we called counter-revolution in democratic uh, uh, form. Well, h- how was that actually possible then? H- how was a counter-revolution in a democratic form possible in the 40s, unlike in the 30s? Because uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but one of the things that, that Leon Trotsky uh, made a prediction about, you know, a perspective about, was that there was going to be, um, you know, a new uh, revolutionary wave after World War II that would, you know, mimic the wave of revolutions, um, you know, after uh, World War One. Um, and of course, I think, you know, we would probably say that, you know, revolutions certainly were a possibility, but there were some crucial ingredients missing in that, wasn't there? Could you could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think I think that uh, the, the difference between the 1930s and the 1940s, uh, certainly the difference with uh, with the 1930s in, in, in Spain and the 1940s across the Western Europe, certainly as a whole, is that the, the the political, social, and above all the economic power of the working class after the Second World War was too big to be crushed absolutely as it had been in Spain or even as uh, Hitler had uh, had uh, crushed it in uh, 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 Germany. But also, I think the capitalism had opportunities to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to fight back. In the post World War, that uh, that uh, it didn't have in the in 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 the nineteen thirties. You see, one of the ironical uh, 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 um, outcomes of the Second World War was that it enabled capitalism to overcome some of the contradictions which had given rise to the uh, uh, to the uh, recession and slump. Of the nineteen thirties, the, the destruction of uh, of industry, the destruction of fixed capital in the course of the war, the destruction of uh, 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 of uh, factories allowed capitalism to retool and rebuild on a, on a higher uh, 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 scale. It allowed for uh, an upswing in, uh, in, uh, in 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 the world economy. And the newly dominant role of American uh, uh, capitalism in the form of martial aid enabled significant uh, economic and social reforms in the post-war uh, world. You know, we had the NHS in uh, in 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 Britain, and uh, and uh, uh, so on. That was a concession to the strength of the working class, but it's one that capitalism would not have been able to afford in the same way in the 1930s. But above all, I think, was the uh, failure of uh, the leaders of the working class, of the either both the reformist leaders like the Labour Party in Britain, and above all, the Stalinist uh, uh, parties, to lead, the, uh, to lead the movement to victory. And all of these three factors came together to enable 
uh, capitalism to uh, restabilize it itself. Yes. And on this basis, I think the tro prognosis, which was ex outlined by Trotsky and the Fourth International in the Transitional Program, published at the, at the start of the Second World War, didn't come about in the way that it that uh, it had been anticipated. Trotsky had written in the Transitional Program the beginning of the war, the sections of the Fourth International will inevitably feel themselves isolated. Every war takes the national masses unawares and impels them to the side of the government apparatus. We saw how that came uh, about. The internationalists will have to swim against the stream. However, the devastation and misery brought about by the new war will quickly prove sobering. The sections of the Fourth International will be found at the head of the revolutionary tide. The problem of the conquest of power by the proletariat will loom in full stature. And the problem was, I think, really, that although the ele all the elements and processes that Trotsky had identified were present, the balance of forces proved crucially different. Fundamentally, the necessary subjective factor for revolution was missing. There wasn't a strong part of Marxist party of world revolution with the size or the authority or the clarity of programme necessary to provide leadership to these struggles. Uh, uh, and this was precisely the what what uh, Trotsky was trying to provide in the in in the transitional program, and it didn't come about on the scale necessary. No, that that really puts it into perspective. I mean, I, I guess the question I would have is: Were there successful revolutions anywhere then? Well, there were revolutionary movements that achieved significant gains for uh, for, for for the masses. And there were there were revolutions which overthrew capitalism, especially in uh, in the, in the in the colonial world. So why and how did that come about? Well, I suppose in in, in a sense, if we look at it uh, 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 overall, the war began as a struggle between imperialist powers to conquer the world, but it ended actually with the downfall. Of a number of empires across the the, the globe. Well, I guess that we're probably uh, running out of uh, 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 time, and probably this could be a whole podcast in itself. But I think it is worth looking at the impact of the of 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 the war on the uh, colonial uh, world, uh, and I can think I can just highlight three factors that I think were really Im important in encouraging. Uh, the national liberation movements and uh, movements for social change in, uh, in, 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 the, in the colonial nations. I think the first was, in actual fact, the initial defeat of French and British imperialism by uh, Japan. We, uh, the empires on which the sun will never set has shown to be invincible. The fact that an Asian power was able to defeat uh, 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 Euro European imperialism gave uh, uh, the peoples of Asia a confidence that they too could uh, rise up against the, their imperialist uh, masters. Another, I think, was that the refusal of the imperialist powers to arm the colonial masses showed how much they uh, uh, feared them. Uh, I think in, in India was especially a case. There's no question that Britain was prepared to lose large parts of India to the Japanese rather than to arm the Indian population. And again, Revolutionary Communist Party, who had many members from India and Sri Lanka within their, their ranks and uh, linked up with the Trotskyist movement in the, in, in the subcontinent, wrote in their paper that they dare not arm them. The contrast between the squalor and misery of the workers and peasants and a tribute of 150 million pounds a year drained from them is too great. The masses will not stop at throwing out the Japanese invaders, but would also throw out the British invaders as well. And that actually was uh, proved by the fact that the, uh, the Indian Navy rolls up after uh, the uh, after the, uh, uh, the, the the war, and that was the decisive factor that brought about Indian independence in 1947. Rather than arm the Indian people and risk India falling into the hands of the Indians, the British imperialists would prefer it to fall into the hands of the Japanese, and that reflected overall the nature of the of the imperialist war effort. You know, this was supposed to be a war against uh, Nazi racism, 
but it ca- that 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 narrative came into direct conflict with the racist bra- uh, basis of the rule of Allied imperialism. You had a situation where there was racial segregation in the U.S. Army. Britain was sending black troops from South Africa to fight in uh, Europe, but they refused to let them carry arms. So you saw the complete contradiction between the uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, supposedly anti-racist uh, role, the supposedly anti-racist nature of the war, and the fundamentally racist nature of uh, of of uh, Western imperialism, and those uh, pressures actually uh, uh, brought about the situation that by 1949, the two most populous nations on earth, uh, China and India, had both sh- sh- broken the shackles of empire. Well, like you were saying earlier, there's there's so much in this topic that would almost merit um, its own episodes of the of the podcast. Now, <laughs> obviously, you know we can um, consider even having discussions on some of these topics in the future uh, in more depth. Um, I guess before we move towards uh, finishing, could you say something a, a bit more about how um, those two most populous nations on earth um, had broken the shackles of empire, China and India? Could you could you flesh that out a little bit further and and, and explain how that really drew an end, drew this this whole period of world history to an end? Yeah, I I think we really only have time to look at uh, uh, China, but again, I think it's very interesting because in China. The, the the communist party was uh, fighting a guerrilla war and it was following it it was fighting it in line with this uh, uh, this, uh, the, this, uh, the, this policy of the communist international of uh, of seeking alliances both with western imperialism and with uh, your your own ruling uh, class they were attempting to uh, fight a peasant guerrilla war as the junior allies of Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang, the so-called uh, National Liberation Movement. But in turn, the Kuomintang were essentially the, the front men for, on the one hand, the, uh, the warlords and the landlords uh, who oppressed the uh, peasantry in China, and on the other hand, of the imperialist powers that have been plundering China since the time of the Opium Wars. Uh, the Kuomintang were in ostensibly a national liberation movement fighting Japanese in real- imperialism. But in reality, they were the front men for Western imperialism and for landlordism. Uh, and, but, and building a peasant army and recruiting peasants to fight uh, for their own liberation inevitably brought Mao and the Communist Party into conflict with landlordism. Uh, and the only way to advance from the country's side to the cities and conquer the nation was to actually overthrow landlordism. So what they found was that inevitably, although they wanted to uh, 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 remain in alliance with the Kuomintang, they were fighting a war effectively, not just against the uh, Kuomintang, but, all, uh, but not most just against Japan, but also against the Kuomintang and their landlord imperialist and capitalist backers. Uh, nonetheless, Despite the fact that they uh, uh, were forced it to oppose the uh, the capitalist class and the the landlords, when the in 1949 uh, Mao took control of Beijing, the capital of China, the, they founded the People's Republic not on the basis of the working class, not on the basis even of the peasantry, but uh, they argued that they were taking power in the name of the what they called the alliance of four classes, the petty bourgeois, the middle class, the national bourgeoisie, uh, the, pe- the workers and the peasantry. The problem was that the national bourgeoisie had, al- had already fled to Taiwan, to Taiwan. Along, <laughs> along with Chiang Kai-shek. So Mao was forced, in effect, just like the Bolsheviks in uh, Russia, in order to carry through the, da- the task of the National De- Democratic Revolution, to expropriate not just the landlords, but also capitalism, and effectively create a workers' state. Now, that might actually sound a little bit um, strange even to some listeners. You know, the idea that we would talk about a leader like Mao um, heading a, a workers' state, because obviously, you know, he shared a lot of the same features 
um, of, of, of Stalin's rule, you know, the totalitarian repression, the violence, the, the, the total lack um, of democratic control. But I think um, it'd be worth uh, taking a bit of time to explain what we mean by worker state a little bit further. Uh, what, what, what do we mean when we use that word? Well, I think that what we would say is that probably the best way of describing what uh, came about in China was that it was never a healthy worker state like Russia in 1917. The workers never ruled directly. Uh, 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 that uh, uh, the state was, was modelled on uh, Stalin's degenerated workers' uh, state, but it had never been a workers' power to be eroded in the same way as uh, it had been in uh, Russia. It was born, if you like, deformed from the very uh, beginning. And in this way, in a, in a sense, in a very distorted way, World War Two ended in in a similar manner to World War One. It began as an imperialist war between capitalist uh, uh, powers, and it was turned into a revolutionary w- war, one in which the rule of capital was overthrown and the means of production were expropri- expropriated. But in this case, unlike in Russia in 1917, this was not done by, but over the heads of the working class. Yeah, so it, it wasn't a conscious act of the working class, but it was these um, these forces that were compelled into doing it, you know, forces like uh, the, what became the, the regime of Mao. Um, so I guess I guess we're really talking here about the end of that era and you know the era of World War II turning into what became known as the uh, as the Cold War. And um, just before we finish, how did that transition happen then? Well, I think it was useful to think about what's often regarded as the last event of the of of the Second World War. Uh, the dropping of nuclear bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Now, that's often portrayed as being a final gamble by the West to force the Japanese to surrender. But if you look at the, uh, at the, at, 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 at the records of that period, it seems very likely the Japanese were about to surrender anyway. So we have to ask, why was it that Truman and Attlee decided to slaughter by science 200,000 uh, civilians in Hiroshima and Sag- Nagasaki. I, sus- I think it's quite, it seems quite likely that that was a warning shot directed at Stalin and uh, the bureaucrats atop the workers' state in Russia. It was, in fact, the opening shot of the Cold War, a half-century a proxy conflicts and counter-revolution as international capitalism attempted to restore its ability to plunder the whole world, something that ended with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the spread of, the, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, capitalism to Eastern Europe and uh, 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 Russia. And I think we have to uh, ask ourselves why that came about. Why did capitalism managed to restore itself as a world power. Was that because workers lacked the willingness to fight? And I think if you look at the area of the, th- of the, th- of the Second World War, if you look at the years that followed the Second World War, we've seen that from Chile to the Hungarian uprising of 1956, workers have never lacked a willingness to uh, uh, struggle. What we lacked was a key role, a key tool to be able to uh, win those uh, struggles. A conscious, trained party of world revolution. We still lack this, uh, but studying these struggles gives us the understanding to build it. We still lack a world party of, of socialist revolution. But in International Socialist Alternative, we have groups of comrades all around the world who are studying and sharing these lessons, who are uh, thinking about how the history history of the movement relates to the struggles that we're having uh, today and are taking the first steps to build uh, a, a new workers' movement. We don't have... Uh, an inflated view of our strength or of the of, of of the easiness of the task we have in front of us, but we do think 
that because we because we we work together because we continue discussing with uh, uh, the class the working class in all of our nations and draw on the experiences we're having and relate them to the history of the movement we can set about the task of rebuilding the workers movement of making small gains to start with but build a movement that can lead to victories and overcome the the, the misery and uh, the existential threat to the survival of the human race that capitalism and exploitation poses today. Thank you for listening to this episode of Revolutionary Ideas. As I said at the beginning, we aim to get this podcast up and running again with regular episodes. So to keep up to date with those, please follow this podcast on all platforms we're hosted on. We also encourage you to get in touch with us in Socialist Alternative. We're an organisation linked with International Socialist Alternative, ISA. We're fighting for revolutionary change and socialism in over 30 countries around the world. If you want to get in touch, you can email us at info at socialistalternative.net. You can fill in our Get Involved form on socialistalternative.info and also donate to us through that channel. Or you can follow us on social media. On Facebook, we're Socialist Alternative, ISA, England, Wales and Scotland. On Instagram, we're socialistalternative.ews. On Twitter, we're socialistalt.ews. And last but not least, on TikTok, we're at socialist underscore vids. Thank you and see you next time.